let's see yeah and so um it's it's really wonderful having everyone join in um today is going to be very very let me use the word powerful because we have a powerful person yeah <laughs> so um i'm glad that we are all tuned in here okay i think um the image just left so but it's fine let's just kick it off any other person that will be joining will be joining our, along the line so um not to take too much of our time um we're going to try to make this as as, as um straight to the point as as possible um so today we'll be uh we, our facilitator will be talking about writing api specs with swagger um well, swagger sounds like swagger <laughs> like it sounds to me so um it's going to be um exhaustive which means it's going to be a comprehensive session it's going to take us all through um and i'm certain i will learn as much as possible so um joshua over to you thank you for joining us today welcome aboard hi joshua can you hear me yes i can hi okay all right uh okay so good um that's all right <laughs> Hi, right, so good evening, everyone. Um, this is this is more of an introductory class, as it were, um, because basically writing API specifications with um, Swagger. Um, I don't think well, I'm waiting for this opportunity to speak because um, Tolu's hand is raised. Yeah, yes, 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 sir. I want to meet you. Introduce yourself. <laughs> okay, so my name is Joshua. Okay, that's about all it is to me. I live in Lagos. I, um, I, um, I'm a graduate of Funas training program for the coding school. Um, I write JavaScript is my preferred programming language, so I write. Um, React for the Node.js, that's React for front-end and Node.js for back-end. I've dabbled into TypeScript too, um, writing a few things in TypeScript these days. What is? I, I think that's about that. Yeah. So um, I'm going to be teaching this from the little mighty knowledge I have about API specifications at Swagger and for the last project that we completed sometime last year, or late last year rather. Uh, I'm going to apologize for the background noise. I am, it's a long story, but forgive me for the background noise if there's any big moving vehicles and all of that. Okay, um, so that said, um, I could just dive straight right in. Okay, so we're going to look at writing APIs with um, Swagger, API specification for Swagger. Note what I said, we're not writing APIs, we're writing API specifications that are different, and we're going to look at that difference today. So before I delve right in, API, 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 if anybody is used to the, um, to the developer world, if I could use that word, the tech bro, tech bro Texas world, that API statement is a common statement. So I would love to ask, start off by asking, um, you could raise your hand, so you could just say, it. yeah, I think I want to hear this. So what do you, what do you think API means? What's the meaning of API? API is supposed to be an acronym, yeah? So what is the full meaning of that acronym? And um, from what you know, what do you think it does? Let's start from there. So I'm going to go as basic as I can, but I mean, it doesn't hurt. So what's an API? That's the question. So what are APIs? What does API mean? That acronym, what does API mean? Anybody? So raise your hand, or I should call someone. I, I used to like that my own piece from my school that like nobody raises their hand. Now start doing one by one through the class. Who do I call? Uh, okay. Um, nobody wants to build the cat. Um, I tell you, me, I, you are the first person that I'm seeing here, so I know it's alphabetical, but forgive me. So I would love you to answer if you're available, though. Um, what does API mean? to your knowledge. What do you think is an API? Should I move to, are you available? Are you not? Should I move with somebody else? I'm seeing tech bros all over here. 
Uh, I don't think IDM is readily available. Can you unmute yourself? Okay, can I go on? Yes, yeah, sure, Michael, shoot. Michael, yes, please answer. Let's make this interactive. I don't like boring classes. All right, nobody wants to build the cats. Somebody has to build the cats. We don't have all day. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, Sorry. I can, Michael. Yes. Hi, Michael. Okay. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm good. And you? I'm good. Thank you. So, um, an API is an application and programming interface, um, which simply means it's like um, a way for two um, programs to interact and actually retrieve um, data from each other. So that's what um, an API simply means. Oh, good stuff. All right. So I think we can start off from there with that basic knowledge. So what are APIs? Well, basically, like you said, API is the, the meaning of the word API or the acronym API is application programming interface. And basically what it does is um, it serves as an intermediary between two computers, two softwares, two programs, two applications. Sometimes it could be more, all right? And so you have, in, so for, for you to have an API, you need to have a set of rules by which these programs can interact with each other. So the reason why they are common in the tech world is because they are the rules by which every program needs to interact with another. So for instance, a very um, quick one is that we could just use something pretty simple, your basic browser, all right? So when you open your web browser and you put in any page at all, that itself, is you making an API request. Um, it's a GET request, it returns, what basically returns is a body, or right, an HTML body that you see on your screen. But that itself is an, it's, is an API request. So it's used for computers to interact with other computers. Usually, or bestly described is a set of rules that has protocols and definitions by which computers, softwares, interact with each other. So you always often have the client, and the server. So we can basically say that an API is the middleware between the server, all right, which would be the application or program or computer that has the information required, and then the client, which would be the computer or software or application that needs the data that the server has. So the API serves as a middleware. So you see the, the funniest example is this. So basically, every, virtually every website that you go to has an API running in the background, all right? So there's always a back end and there's the front end. So basically, we could use a restaurant as an example. So you have the back end where people are cooking in the restaurant, somewhere in the restaurant, people are making all the dishes and all the food. Um, I'm not a fan of eating out, so I can't start listing out foods that people eat, yeah? And then there's the, there's the restaurant where people come into and then everybody sits and then they don't go to, you see, they don't go to the kitchen to ask for food, it doesn't work like that. So they have attendants, waiters that come and ask, what do you want? Now the waiter comes and the waiter comes with um, a list that contains the menu. It comes with the menu rather. So these are the things that we have available in this kitchen. The waiter obviously and the person in the, and the people in the kitchen, they work in the same team. So usually you find APIs coming from the back end, right? So you usually find API to be um, children of back end of um, back end applications. So you have that, and then you come to the person in front and say, "Oh, what do you want? What what's what's your order?" And so imagine the person in front says, um, "Is in say let's say, let's say he's at um, Ibadan, he's at Amalaskai. I hate Amalaskai, it's no grammar, Amalaskai, but he's at Amalaskai, and then." Um, by that, I mean that like the name. So I hear. So it comes to Alaska and then it says, um, it says, so what do you want to do? Obviously, we're not there. What do you want to do? There's Kilefeje. <laughs> and then he says, um, he wants shawarma and um, um, some meat pie. And then he's going to wait if they can get pizza ready in 20 minutes. You know, readily, if you were there and you saw somebody make that kind of order, you say, 
are you sure you know where you are you are right this is our last guy i'm supposed to ask for mala and um it will do and now what else i don't like that thing though and whatever else that you but the people eat i say i suppose ask for that but you're asking for something which you can ask for but you're asking for it in a different place so the api is obviously going to throw an error all right the api is going to return an error now what i've just said which i want you to see is that the api comes the api has a set of protocols don't forget what we just said there are set of protocols or definitions there are set of rules for interaction between the two computers so when you come and then you say you want to buy shawarma in mama put shop she's going to send you away all right that's error four like we don't sell shawarma here if you go to a store where shawarma is so that you say you want to buy um amala yes are you right in the wrong place so the api specifications are the set of rules designed or let me just written down for interaction between the server and the client so the client when he has the api specifications know what to ask for so in a case where the person walks into the restaurant for instance usually very good restaurants will have their menu put on the table so you pick that menu and that becomes your api so it's okay i want to eat shawarma but they don't have so what do you do you either leave there or you go you either leave there or you take any other option that's available those are that's basically what an api does right serves as the intermediary that provides what is available to the client and when it is not available lets the client know it is not available so the api has set of rules it has set of um definitions it has protocols things that they expect that the client would follow to get what they want so you can't just come in and just ask just badge and take anything no you have to get you have to get a ticket or some other tickets you have to get a ticket you have to pay for it first before you get your food and all of those things so that's basically what an api is so there are different types of apis based on their release policy there are the private apis there are the partner apis and then there are there are external apis so private apis basically used within an organization for instance facebook um meta rather has a private api they have a code base that is used within that organization for the applications made by that organization right every most times when um, an application is created for instance and you have a back end and a front end for that application there's a private api in place where the things that the front end needs are served by the back end which serves as the server and then there's an application interface for them to interact with each other to get exactly what they want so apps are built for private apis the apps are built for company employees right and there's company applications as company systems embedded within it for partner apis these are used only um, it's only available for business partners as it is so um what um is the example could i use so for meta i can use meta for this for example so there facebook has internal applications that they use in developing stuff that they do so they have private apis then they have partner apis all right which obviously anybody that has their application gets to access and of aside that so there are other um folks that don't have um facebook application for instance that are partners with facebook that get to use facebook api some of their apis so um like you see the, the most popular use cases apis between two organizations all right and then the third one which is the more common one which is for example the one you find on a website like rapid rapidapi.com um is the public or external api so these ones are open to general public um they can be commercial and you may have to pay to use them they can be free or they can be freemium you see api world that decor that i hear that freemium will be that you have maybe 100 200 um calls that are free then afterwards you have to pay for every call every API call that you make so and then such cases the apps are designed for end users and consumers alone they're not obviously expecting that they're going to take that api to not create another api or things like that and so those are the apis that we have generated by release policies okay now this is where we are getting right into what we're looking at so we have what we call api architecture and protocols don't forget how we started um we said at the start that for an api to work there has to be a set of rules 
there has to be a set of definitions and there has to be some sort of protocol. You remember? So with that, we now have what we call, or what is called API architecture and protocols. So these are basically um, the protocols by which um, APIs are built, by which applications interface with each other. Um, there's the first one is SOAP. Um, the SOAP API is not outdated. I almost said outdated, but it's phasing out. It's not common anymore, but it is used, still in use by um, native organizations. By native organizations, for instance, banks. So there are some banks, for instance, where their applications were built 10, 20 years ago. And to ask them to you know, drop down those applications and use the language of the day is going to cost the bank a lot of money or maybe a lot of funds or maybe a lot of time. And so what the bank does is that they maintain that standard. Now, what they use in those kind of applications is what is called the SOAP API. Now, what's the SOAP API, basically? So SOAP API um, is a structured application interface that uses XML. I don't know if anybody knows what XML looks like. So let me take a minute to um, get you a copy of what XML looks like. Um, XML is not that much popular today anymore for well, reasons best known. One, it's not as easy to use as JSON. So many organizations do not use XML anymore. I thought I saved it, but I did not. I had to look for it. Uh, give me a minute. Okay, so I'll just look for it while I'm on this. So we have, they use XML, basically. So you have um, the header and then the body. Then you have, let me, let me see this. Um, we all, I believe that all of us are familiar with HTML, right? I want to believe so. So um, the XML is virtually similar to HTML, all right? It's markup language, all right? It's just basic markup language. But it has different set of rules compared to HTML. In fact, the HTML one was written in XHTML, all right? So it's just a child of XML. So you have XML, then you have, that's for SOAP APIs, then you have WebSocket API. Now, let me say this so that this is clear. Our common idea of API is, is that one person requests and the other person gives the response. And that's all we often think API are. But in the case of WebSocket API, both applications can make requests from each other and both applications can supply um, data to each other. That is, for instance, if you have permitted to use front-end backend, the backend can make a request from the front-end the front end can make a request, I mean, to the front end. The front end can make a request to the back end. So both applications can re make requests from each other. In that case, we call it a web socket. It's called a web socket at API, where both applications can make requests. Both applications can sell either as clients or as servers. Any of the applications can serve as a client. Any of the applications can serve as a server, depending on the use case in that particular instance. So you have that. Then you have what is called remote procedure calls. The remote procedure calls are not common. The remote procedure calls are not common, but they exist, all right? So it's not something that you re relatively find um, common these days. So um, how best do I explain it? So in a remote um, procedure, there are rules, there are certain actions that need to be carried out for something to be done. I want to, because we really we are not talking about APIs. Sorry about that. In particular, um, that's why I don't have all of this listed out. I would have maybe taken a bit more time. I don't want to spend too long to list out what um, remote procedure calls are. But remote procedure calls are action oriented. And the only support get and post request. You know, um, there's get request, post request. There's, we look at all of that when we get to the last one. So they are not flexible, right? And um, they only use XML. 
right? You also need etanol. Now, these are old ones, right? So, and now we see a pretty old. The most common one, which you'll probably find every, virtually every day, is, is the REST API, which is what we're just going to work with this. The REST API is representation, representational state transfer. I did not spell this correctly. Representational state transfer. In other words, um, let me explain it so that, that you can get it. Every other um, API, the SOAP and the RPC, they save the data or the other data that the client uses to make a request. So for instance, if you go to a restaurant to order for food and you say, I want to order for, um, for sorry, I didn't know how to order, rice and chicken, basic stuff. So when you get there, I say you want to order for rice and chicken, they open up rice and chicken, serve rice and chicken. But what is done in the background is that that data, so in the case of RPC and so, that request, for instance, is saved somewhere on the server. So the next time you come and then you say, oh, I want to buy food, they'll just immediately ask you, is it rice and chicken? Because they've saved your request the last time. So that's what, that's a stateful, it's called stateful APIs, or a stateful request. So your data is saved in a state on the server. But for stateless requests, which REST does, those requests, the headers are not saved on the server. The server does not, if you come today and ask for rice, they give you rice. If you come two minutes later and ask for rice, nobody's going to tell you, but well, you just ate now. No, you just, just finished eating rice like two minutes ago. No, they're going to serve you the rice again. I become just after asking for it, doctor table say, I want guys again. They're going to so there's no record on the database of you making that sort of request. Right? So there's no nobody's keeping that data of the, of the number of requests that you are making anyway. That's rest. All right. So in the case of REST API, you have um, the the body of the API is usually JSON. That's JavaScript object um, um, notation model, right? So usually we turn in JSON, which is usually the common one, all right? It also supports HTTP methods, which is why it is common today, particularly with web, web applications. Um, defined virtually every web application using REST API. That's because it supports all the HTTP methods. You get the post, the put, the patch, and delete. Get, post, put, patch, delete. Um, let me create a quickly question, quickly, because I was asked this question a long time ago, one time. Um, so if you're used to HTTP methods, um, let me just, okay, so the HTTP method get is what you do every time you open your browser and put in a website, uh, a URL. You are basically making a get request to so say, hi, can I get the content of the body of the Sunas website? So, okay, so how do you want to get it? Okay, so this is my request header. So you just put in the URL and then it gives you, the, gets to the server, the server gets you the body, all right? HTML, obviously, HTML body of the Funas website homepage, which is what you're going to get because that's the request you make. Then I say, oh, okay. So if you click the button and say, okay, I want to look for programs, I click programs. So you see up there on your URL, you see slash programs as it should be. And then that's another request to the server, all right? So that's a get request. You're basically making a get request. A post request to be that, that you are taking a set of data and you are putting it into the database in the back end. So back end, obviously, you have the database where information is being stored from and where information is saved into, right? Um, and so you say a post request would be you take bulk of information and say you want to save it on the database. And then when you save it on the database, you can always to get, so you now use a get request to get it again. Let's use a very simple example. Um, um, when you want to log in, or when you, want to, when you open, an application, for instance, and you want to create an account. That whole sequence of creating an account, you are most likely going to make a post request. That is, your data is going to be taken and saved into the database backend. So the application interface will take data from you and save it into the backend. All right, that's there. And so every time you log in again, it will be a get request, sort of. So okay. I want to log in. So, so that's true. Okay, I think it was the body. 
Sorry about the noise. Can you give us the body of what you want to request for? Say, okay, I want to request for this, and I want to request for this. And then they get that for you. Okay, right? Well, we're spending a lot of time on this, and we need to wrap up, get to what you exactly want to do. So it takes the get request, post request, push the put request, patch, and delete request, all right? So it allows and accepts others, content others, content types, and all of that. Some people use XML with um, REST API, but it's not common, actually. Some people do. The common one is the JavaScript project application, that's JSON. Um, so in creating an API, the, the five basic things that you have to pay attention to, you have to plan the API, you have to build it, obviously, you have to test it, you have to document the API, and then you have to mark it. So this is where we get hands on. When you say plan the API, what do you mean? If you write code, and I believe you do, you know by now that um, knowing what to do is one thing, doing it is another thing. Oftentimes, when you want to write code, you have to sit down to make your plan, okay, so this is going to ask for this. If this happens, then this happens. If this is happen, this is going to happen. So you have some sort of plan. The same way with APIs, yeah, you don't, it's not expected that you just wake up one morning and say, okay, I want to build an API. And so you just get on your system, you open maybe Node.js or um, Steam PHP or Laravel or any other um, backend microservice app, um, software you could get lay your hands on Java or something, um, or Golang, and then you open it up and then you start writing, okay, this is what I want to do, this is what I want to do, this is what I want to do, and just put it up. And then you just put it online. It doesn't work like that. There's usually the need for specifications. Now, what are specifications? Specifications are basically your design blueprints. All right, so you are saying, this is what I want to happen when this request is made to this particular website. That's what your specification is. So your specification now becomes the set of rules, all right, for your API. With that, with a specification in mind or with a specification done, you can now proceed to development knowing that you are going to mirror the output and the request in your specification in your um, in your code base because you cannot give your code base to an end user. You can't say, okay, I'm done developing, you know, so come and take my backend and put on your system. No, you are going to have to deploy that backend um, application somewhere on the server where they can interface with. So how are they going to interface? They are going to use API endpoints. How are they going to get no which endpoints to use? So we have API specification. So Swagger um, allows developers to sort of design um, a, permit me to use the word good looking, easy to navigate API specification so that end users, so that end users can readily, easily see um, what to use, all right? So I know what to call, where to call, how to make the call, what parameters are expected, what is expected in the body of this request. So you use APIs, you use the API specification for that. And that's where Swagger comes in. So at this point, um, because we're really not, I was hoping that I was gonna have enough time to say, um, well, can I look through the API specification? I can't do that API um, with Node.js because I kind of did the, um, the, the base, Structure, but we do not have all the like the root set. So um, we're just going to look at API specifications. So I'm going to go to my um, I'm going to go to my VS Code right about now, and um, so here goes this. Can you see my VS Code? Yeah, yes. Yes. Can you increase right. your screen? Can I make oh, it? Sorry, sorry. Yeah. We're well, used to looking at this time. Yeah. All right. So is this Boulder? Yes, yeah, it's fair enough. Yeah. Yes, right. better. thank you. Okay. So um, like I said, I was trying to like, get something simple up and running so we could just um, we work with, but I don't know if we have all the time in the world. So, but we're just going to start with here we can. So, um, Swagger uses what is called an open API um, specification. So, open API specification is basically a free specification um, 
structure that developers can use. And this developer follows that structure. And so with OpenAPI, you can now um, you have some sort of proper structure, readable structure for your code base for anybody that wants to see it. Um, I use VS Code. And so like you know VS Code, there are a lot of extensions readily available. So you can see here, I have an OpenAPI extension. If I want to create an OpenAPI um, view, and then I can use Swagger to view it. Give me a minute. Uh, yeah. So you can see, so you can see here, I can open the API and show people using Swagger UI. So Swagger allows you to take what you do with the open API code base um, specification and display it in a pretty beautiful UI. I think it's somewhat beautiful. Okay, good. Um, so I don't have anything here yet. So this is API type two. This is the version, version one. This is um, this is open API specification three. And then so let's say um, so let's say that we want to have let's say we want to write API for um, say we want to be able to get users. So we want to let's say we pretend that we have an application, we want to get an application that takes users. Uh, we want to be able to get all the users in the application. We want to also be able to get information for one user. Right? Then we also want to maybe post, obviously, we're going to have to add the user to the database, post um, user data. What else? We want to update the user data. Update. Uh, what else? What else can we do with this user data? I think this is about all right. So let's say we want to delete. We want to delete the user data. What else can we do? Somebody help me, help me, help me. I think this is about all right. So we can want to want to create an application for users. We want to get all the users. We want to get it for one particular user. So for instance, if the users are saved by their unique IDs, for instance, let's say every user has in, in um, institutions, you have what's called market numbers. Every user has some code. So we can say we want to get our users by, by their code. And that also means that we, we are beating users by their code. And then we also be beating users by our code. Now, this is what we want to do. We could just as well get into our um, code base and write the code for them. It's okay, so we want to get to that. But with the structure that we have here now, it helps us to see exactly what we want to do. So for the sake of um, clarity, I'm going to like just start with this again. Um, so you can, if you have VS Code, you can just download OpenAPI. Life is simple with snipers here and there. So if I click on OpenAPI here, it's obviously looking at this one that I currently have open, my chest demo. Um, I'd have to start a new one. <laughs> I don't want to delete this. Okay, I can let me do this. So, um, okay, so I can say I want to. There's no part here. All right, okay, so let's start. Um, so I'll create a new file um, to test the YAML. So YAML is what is used for um, open API specifications. So open API, I don't know what this is going to be One minute. Uh, so open API, so you are going to have to list the specification in the 3.0.2. All right, so now we know that we're using version 2.0.2. Uh, we're going to need, so I just did this, and then it gave me the various things that are needed, right? For these are the various components for this YAML file I'm creating, this structure I want to work with. So I need to have components, 
um, I'm going to have the information, the parts, the URL will be part of the information. So if I say I want to put the information, so it's going to ask me what the title is. So I'll say the title is um, um, API class demo. And uh, that will be the title of my application. And this is the version of control. So then, so I need the, the most important things required are the title and the versions. So I say, okay, what else? What else do you think I need to have there? So I need to have contact. So who is the contact? Say, so, okay, what's the email of my contact? So, okay, let's say my email is um, Joshua. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. So that's my email. Now, you notice that if you don't put the correct email, obviously it flags you. So, what else do you think I need? I need to have my name. Now, all of this is not necessary as it were. The necessary thing for your information is the title and the version. All right? So, this is the contact person or the person working on this API. So, you can see it's still flagging it because it has not seen the parts that I want to work with. Okay, so let's say my name is Joshua. Where does Swagger come in? Um, so I have um, an extension, a Swagger extension that basically displays on the side. The other option you have, which is often used, is to use editor.swagger.io, editor.swagger.io. So what this basically does is that it takes your, it asks you for a code base or body structure, basically, for Swagger. And then to expect that you, you know, have some sort of definition. So I'm just going to quickly show you what you see when you open editor.swagger.io away from my code base now. Um, and Swagger D4. So as you can see, um, a lot of work on going. <laughs> so this is the base structure that you find when you open editor.swagger.io. All right, this is like the base structure that you have. So if I close this, for instance, first it's, it comes with it. Refresh, and it just gives you some sort of base structure. So you have open API, the version, the type, the info, the title, this is the description, the terms of service, if there's any available, the contact. Um, what is this, what is this, what is this? Oh, I still have the last time that we were working with. Okay, I need to, um, I need to open an incognito browser and not have data from what we've done. So let me do that. New share. This, this, one, this one should not be anything. I believe it should be burnt. I believe it should be burnt. Yes, exactly. This is what you should have. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so the open API by some people. So again, this is Swagger. This is so Swagger makes your life easy. It gives you some sort of base where you can now start working with. So you can change things, you can remove things. This is basically an API for um, for um, a pet store, all right? And so it says, this is sample pet store, this is title, this is description, just as we have in our VS code, remember? Um, I think I can just show the whole of my screen right now. So Forgive me, please. Mm -hmm. All right. So I can just basically change it. Yeah, I've done the undoable. Okay. So uh, 15 minutes to wrap up. I think I'll just take questions from you okay, and, and then you just go to the questions. I was hoping we'd be able to go to the team and maybe we write our own by ourselves, but we don't have all the time in the world. Um, so when you go to okay. editor.swagger.io, Swagger, Swagger okay. has some sort of base um, API specification for you. Right. It's not something that you're working with, but it just gives you some sort of basis. So you know 
how to navigate what you want to do. So the open API information, the title, the description. Again, notice how it is indented, all right? Which is another very important thing. Swagger is particular. In fact, Yama and API specifications are particular with indentation. If I mistakenly push this by one tab, see that's flagged an error. It says it's a bad indentation of a mapping entry, so it's not indented properly. If I move this back and I push this to flag the error, bad indentation of a mapping entry. So your indentation is key in Swagger. Now, in, when you're writing code, you really don't need to indent, although it's advised that you indent your codes for usability. But Swagger demands that your code is indented properly for you to pass that it's a rightly written code. And because if you don't indent it properly, it would affect how it's seen. Now, let me explain this for the sake of explaining it. Or sometimes, this swag, um, API specification, this Swagger open API specification can be written in JSON. Now, if you're writing a JSON code, um, we don't have all day, but if you're writing a JSON code, there is obviously indentation. So there's a child of a child. So you have a big body, open API info, then oh. uh, so you so you have um you have the open API, all right, which is a property of the JSON body or object. You have info, a property. Now the info now has title and description as properties. So if you do this, for instance, you are saying open API. Then you are saying info, title, and description are children of open API, which is wrong, all right? So your indentation is important when it comes to Swagger. Um, so let's bring, bring this to a close. So this is the description of what they have here. Um, we could just change all of this to say, um, all right, this is a sample, get stuff, blah, 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 blah. It has links. Um, and then I could just remove all of this and say, this is uh, I don't have parameter. So this changes that. Then the terms of service, obviously, you can do that. The contact, the license, um, this is usually just given to you, right? Automatically. The version, the external documentation. Now, in external documentation, if you are maybe working with some sort of UI screens, you can put it there. Um, you can put some URL there, some sort of external documentation of what you want to do. In fact, you can have an API documentation and put that as an external documentation. Servers is where you are, where it's important. So these servers is actually how we are going to, or where we are going to go to, to make our request. Then you have the tags, pet, store. Tags are basically the common things that we're looking at, right? The or classes of things that we are working with. So in what we wanted to write initially, we were going to have our tags. If we were going to do tags, the tags would just be user. All right, so let's, let's try and do this. Let's say tags. All right, so tag name, users. All right, so tag name, users. Um, and then for users, we can put a description. Let get this right. Sorry, my yeah, he's trying to read my head. Yeah, we are going to put description, description. Yep, yeah. and then we say um, um, users. Obviously, I have to put this. So, yeah, that's okay. This is not indented well. Can you see the issue? Can you see how indentation was an issue? Flagged property description is not allowed. So I have to put this properly so it is indented properly. It's not standing as a child of tag. It's child standing as a child of name on that tag, all right? Um, so that's that about tags. Then the really most important one is the paths. So the paths, uh, let me put servers. Servers. So we need to we need to URL. Let me just see. HTTP. Yes. URL. 
So, in our parts, that's where we're now going to start having different parts. So, let's go back here. We're just going to do parts and then we'll take, maybe take a few questions. Right so, we want to get users. So, we're going to have a part, say, users. All right. Abi? So, you're going to have a part, users. And then, so you have pets. Now, see what is done on that pet. So you have a part called pet, but you have a put request. You have a post request. All right. You can also you can have a get request. You can also have a get request. You have pet slash find by status. You have a get request. You have find by tags, get request, by ID, get request, post request, delete request, by upload image, post, get. So for each part, you can have all the different HTTP um, um, methods, the put, the post, the get, and you can just put them in that structure. So for instance, um, I could go bufuna.org slash um, students, and it gives me all the students, all right? That's a get request. I could also go bufuna.com slash students, and I am trying to push the data for a new student. That's a post request. That should be under the same part slash students. I could also go, um, what else? So I could go dufuna.com slash student slash student code. So let's say my code is JOS, JOS, so slash JOS. That will give me a get request. I could go slash JOS again. And I'm trying to maybe change my image or my name or my email or my password. So all of those things here, we put them under the path. What this does, let's just stay with this as it goes. What this does now, is that it gives me now let me mention this because this is also important the uh the, sorry, the components so the components serve as i just allow us to go through all of this because of time one hour now I promise one hour i promise yes they say blessed is he who keeps the time they shall call him again at least to say that for me <laughs> so you have components, all right? So for the components, you have the schemas. Then you have request bodies, then you have security schemas. And let me say this, that for your components, you need this. These schemas are basically how you expect the body of data to be set. So for instance, let's look at something quickly. This order is a schema. It takes, is the type of the order is object. Properties, ID, pet ID. Again, I want you to look at it as an object. So this is an object, right? Order is an object. So in the case where we're looking at order, uh, we have good stuff, order. So in the case where somebody wants to place an order, is whatever the person is going to put from the front end has to be an object, all right? An object that has properties of ID, which is an integer. Uh, pet ID is also an integer. Quantity is an integer. Uh, <coughs> integer. Um, Ship date, which is a date time um, format, status, which is a string. All right. And there's an example here status that can actually be placed, approved, or delivered. So you have enumerable, then complete, true or false. So look at this. This is this. So they please simply took that and put it here. So what would the response be? To simply respond back with the data that was pushed in. All right, so uh, I'm sorry that sounds all fast and maybe I was not as co coherent as I would have loved to be um, for reasons best known. But so it, basically with the editor.saga.io base data, you have virtually everything that you need to get to work on getting your um, API specification up and running. So don't forget that the key things here are your indentation, your open API, open tag of your the info, the info, and the parts, the parts, and then your components, which obviously contain your schema and your security schema. With this three point of mind, I hope I'm able to finish. Sorry, I'm sorry this is so fast. Any questions, please? Does this make sense? Have we learned something? In the midst of all my rush, rush, and talk, talk, have we learned something? Looking at time. 
Yes, like Joshua, I'm actually, but I got lost because and I got... have questions. Because you're talking, I suddenly yes, yes, I, I, I was just flowing, but when you now speak to the um to the editor, the blog editor, I couldn't see your screen, so I just oh. But what was Can you see it now? No, I need it. I need it bolder. I can't see the code. Sorry, okay. sorry. Okay, so you could just. I think I put it in the um in the chat, so you could just check. I could just. The problem is I'd have to. Sorry, I'm let's move please. All right, is it clearer? So I could yeah. just go back and this again. All right, so it's the editor swagger that I you gives you the base structure for what you want to do. The open API. So I said the key things here are your identification, the and then your open API, your info, and your parts. The parts are important, your parts and the structure. So I said you can put all the different methods on that different parts, right? Depending on the different things you want to do with that part. And then your server, which is obviously what's going to be called. So what you see here, for instance, we don't have time is gone. We just say try it out. So it gives us an example. You could say try it out. So if you say try it out, it will give you some sort of dummy request body. The request body is application.json. And you try this thing. I'm not sure this is supposed to work, but under normal circumstances. All right. So this. But other normal circumstances, you will get the exact response. So if you put in, if you change the data here, then we we'll also get to change the data in our response. In fact, what even it goes for that to give you how you can make this a call request. So the request URL will be this, and it goes on. So with editor of Swagger.io, you have um, let me call it a code snippet to start your work with, where everything that you need. Is there to start with, and then you know you are just changing what is there, and you know that if you stay with that structure that you have, you have a perfect API specification for whatever you do. Does that help? Yes, so I asked yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. So any other question? Um, have we learned something? However, still, have we learned something? Can we call it? And even has this been a that was successful? What has it been worth the time? And then, Amy, I was are you are you still here? Michael, are you still here? Yes, yeah, I'm still here. Right. So has this been worth it? Did yeah, you learn something? Yeah. yeah, um apart from like um kind of the noisy background and um, yeah, the uh, time to meet up with time. I I, I yeah I I grab some like a lot concerning your explanation. Maybe I've actually encountered or walked to the platform before. So what you are explaining. So I was like you know picking up because I've you know I've walked with Swagger before. So I, I really I really understood um, your explanation though. So thank you very much for your time. Yeah. Uh, sorry about the background I really wish I could do something about it. Um it is what it is. All right, so um I think we can call it an evening. Um I was actually hoping we're going to be to write code days and all of that, but when it is what it is. Maybe some other day we can do a part two, I'll just put it up from there. Um, so Tolu, um, floor's yours. I think we're good. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Um, yes, uh, this, this has really been an insightful session. Thank you for, um, creating the time. Yeah. I understand a bit of, um, some of the things you had to go through and I'm glad that you were able to uh, make it and take time out to us through all this. Um, do we have anyone that has any questions? Okay, sounds like no more questions. So we can um, call it an evening here. Um, okay, so Michael has a question. I can see you raising his hands. Michael, please go ahead. No, no, I was, I was actually like commending him for taking out his time you know, to put us through on this. Um, 
<laughs> so and that stuff. So I, I'm just like you know trying to applaud him. So I'm not I'm not raising up my hand for oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Okay, so in case um we all um just so that we'll know um Joshua is not exactly comfortable where he is, uh, but he still took his time to um take us through this session. So thank you so much, Joshua. This is um, this, this is we're, we're really grateful. So um, next week um, our programs will be resuming next week. Um, the coding session, the the coding check-in sessions, the design PM check-in sessions, and all other programs. So as we always say, please engage, please get involved. Um, because there is there is a lot to learn. All these sessions they are they are meant to build us and you know help us get better. Um, as we all know, you know, no man is an island of knowledge. So one way or the other we would have picked up one or two things here. Um, so so that's that's pretty much it. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining in. Um, have a wonderful evening and a beautiful weekend ahead. Cheers, guys. Bye. Thank you.